Hey folks, Paul here. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, not that everyone's left. Um, the, the channels remained relatively active uh, uh, during my hiatus and appreciate that. So, where were we? <laughs> oh yes, video fishing journal number 36 now. Which means I have a fishing story to tell. Oh, it's a big, big bass. Whoa! Okay, 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 okay. Take and drag on me. And put through the nature of fishing filter, this fishing story is as much about the water and the conditions and circumstances as it is about lures thrown or fish caught. Fish caught are the result of a process, uh, one of understanding how the fish's environment works and how fish are apt to respond to it. Uh, what tackle I choose is down on the priority list. Not unimportant, but first things first. We first have to find those fish. For those new to this channel, this is what the nature of fishing is about. The foundational stuff that, that underlies the decisions we need to make out there on the water. Uh, this video fishing journal number 36 demonstrates, better demonstrates, the role heat plays in motivating fish to migrate and move, uh, allowing us to predict where those fish may end up, revealing some of the very best places to cast. This video fishing journal will look uh, and sound look a bit different from the previous ones. That's because the nature of fishing is now operating in an entirely new region of the country. All of our previous videos were shot in northern Colorado. Uh, we'll now be diving into waters of the upper Ohio River Basin in western Pennsylvania, some 1,500 miles from where all our previous videos were shot. Despite that 1,500 mile distance, I expect we'll be able to pick up where we left off in Colorado. Uh, these Pennsylvania largemouths should be pretty much the same basic critter. Which means we'll continue to track the same conditions and circumstances just as we always have. If you are new to this channel, you might want to see our previous videos as we've been developing the background and terminology as we go. In particular, you may want to watch our conditions and circumstances videos in our fundamentals playlist. I made those videos so I don't have to feel bad when I say the inevitable depends on conditions when trying to describe the myriad factors that influence our fishing. Okay, let's narrow things down a bit to our first Pennsylvania study ponds. Conveniently, there are two ponds right here on the property I now call home. We'll be calling them for convenience Ponds A and Pond B. Uh, ponds A and B. Poetic, huh? <laughs> pond A is just over an acre and a half in size. a good size for direct observation uh, and a great place to test tackle and lure modifications. Sure beats the bathtub. Pond B, the one we'll be fishing in this journal entry, comes in at just over 11 acres in size. Both are man-made with earthen dams. Both are forest land ponds. Uh, this means that a lot of coarse materials drop in from the surrounding forest leaves, branches, entire trees, dead chipmunks, you name it. All the things that towering forest lands can produce. Both ponds are privately owned, uh, co-owned by multiple families. And both are essentially unmanaged, uh, beyond the addition of grass carp at some point. Uh, and various species dropped in on other people's whims over the pond's hundred plus year long histories. So far, my underwater video observations have revealed uh, largemouth bass, bluegill, pumpkin seed sunfish, yellow perch, uh, golden shiner, 
brown bullhead and, and grass pickerel. I'm told northern pike were introduced over well over 20 years ago and I've seen some large hooks on sonar uh, that made me think big pike um, or, or possibly catfish. Uh, so I'll be awaiting my first bite offs. <laughs> as far as the fishing intel I could gather goes, uh, both ponds are fished, but somewhat lightly. In part, I'm told, because both have a reputation for containing stunted bass. Now, I'm not entirely put off by waters with reputations for stunted bass, as there can be much more to such waters than what the random casting to shorelines that a lot of people do might be able to reveal. So the question is, how large a population of quality sized bass might there be? Uh, there will be some, but are there enough to warrant spending precious fishing time on? There is no professional agency or public social media info available for this water, uh, so it amounts to my talking with locals and my own fishing. You might want to see Video Fishing Journal uh, 32 on how getting a bead on population size structure can help us, um, at least with our expectations for the waters that, that we fish. So far, it appears that the population of quality size bass is indeed low, um, and that is fish in the 14 to 17 inch range. There are large numbers of small skinny bass, though, uh, 10 inches in length and under. And some of these little bass are actually mature. having developed reproductive tissues at a stunted size. Um, that's pretty much the definition of stunted. This could be a land and water fertility issue, uh, not uncommon in forest land ponds, uh, but the surrounding geology, aquatic vegetation growth uh, present, uh, and, and the sheer number of mid-sized sunfishes suggest otherwise. Problem is, a lot of mid to larger size sunfish don't always help and can even hinder growth for many bass in a pond. All this said, there is plenty of food for larger bass in both study ponds. The rub is that young bass need to be able to break that prey fish size barrier to be able to grow large enough to access the majority of the food in that pond. Individuals that can accomplish this appear to have plenty of quality food there. So who knows who lurks in pond B? Okay, that's some background on just where the heck we are and what we're about to see. Let's get out onto the water, pond B, and narrow things down to casting water. If populations of quality fish are indeed low, we'll have to be fairly precise in our search, and we'll need the existing conditions and circumstances to smile on us here and there. In this case, the seasonal timing, the spring feeding binge window, and the conditions and circumstances window that sets up, gives me a darn good shot at finding out just who lurks in this pond. Okay, here's our fishing water for this video fishing journal. Let's break it down into main structural areas and their functions from which we can base our seasonal fishing strategy. The main basin is the deepest area of the lake. Functionally, it likely provides the main wintering areas and, and possibly summering areas in the lake. The shallow shelves or flats support the majority of the vegetation and therefore a good chunk of the primary productivity, the base of the food chain, serving as hunting grounds for bass. There is a super shallow back basin, uh, I'm calling back bay, averaging only about two and a half feet deep that's connected to the main lake by a rather long three to four foot deep channel. The mouth of the channel is where this dammed pond's creek channel enters. 
From here, the creek channel slides from five feet deep into the 13 foot deep uh, main lake basin. The creek channel then exits at 10 feet deep into the shallow three to four foot outflow arm. That's the playing field. Let's look at how the conditions and circumstances, namely the weather, shapes our fishing. To translate the weather outside to the water and the fish, I now dig into my tackle box and pull out one of the most important tools in there. At least if you want to know the whys that underlie what's going on down there. No, it's not a whopper plopper, it's a thermometer. Water temperatures can give us a bead on just where we are in the season and put us in the ballpark as to expected fish behavior and activity. So here's our water temperatures and where things get interesting, allowing me to better focus my casting. Here's my protocol for those new to this channel or who might need a refresher. I first check for the pond's core temperature, the temperature of the main mass or volume of water out there. Core temperatures, essentially mid-water temperatures, best determined by taking a full profile, are those buffered from the vagaries of surface temperatures, providing the best estimate of where we are in the season. If the lake is very large, you may have more than one core area to work from. This being a large pond, where the basin is not far from the shallows, I'm considering the main basin the most likely wintering and possibly summering area to work from. At 50 degrees Fahrenheit, at just four feet down, this pond is only just sliding out of winter conditions. Now enter the weather. Back to back intense, even unseasonable heating days has me following my thermometer and the associated buzz of life up into that super shallow dark bottom back bay, cooking away under glorious spring sunshine. Under this rapid heating period that's spilling out of the sky, my thermometer then reveals a natural heat gradient spilling down the channel out of that shallow back bay. These temperatures contrast strongly with the pond's main basin, or core. Spring may have sprung, but it does not do so equally across the pond. Heat gradients are important to fish. They've been used experimentally to determine the heat preferences and tolerances for fish species. Bass and other sunfishes, in particular, are heat lovers and heat seekers. When placed in an experimental heat gradient for an extended time, they continue to seek heat up into temperatures higher than many natural waters can provide the majority of the year. In northern waters, this can even be true in summer. The full physiological and behavioral story is complex, but reasonably well understood. The upshot is, while bass are heat lovers, other habitat factors, as well as the ability to get fed, play major roles in what temperatures bass may be found at, at any one time or place. That said, strong heat gradients can bring some amazing fishing. Heat gradients can be a key ingredient for what I've come to call carnage zones, where both prey and predators are drawn into tight, often predictable, spaces. Now, this back bay is so shallow, the entire bottom is exposed, one might think that quality bass wouldn't dare use it, especially this early in the season when the vegetation hasn't grown in to offer cover, in, in particular overhead cover. But the cascade of events that heat gradient creates is apparently enough of a draw to bring at least some quality fish into the picture. This back bay, however, is just the start of our story, setting up a window into just what this pond may have to offer.
These are grass carp, true heat pigs, heading up the gradient into Back Bay. And, of course, they are not the only ones. A camera placed in the channel recorded a continuous parade of heat seekers. I've seen these heat seeking movements, or, or migrations, many times before in other waters. Waters as large as the Great Lakes and as small as farm ponds. Very cool to see such a starkly obvious setup. It wasn't long before this heated back bay was packed with bluegills. Bass are attracted to heat. However, quality sized ones, such as this one, prefer to stay somewhat deeper than the bluegills and little bass are willing to be. Large bass may prefer to stay deeper yet in areas providing greater water volume and or better cover options. Structurally, Back Bay is super shallow, averaging a mere two feet deep. Despite the super shallow depths, I spied three quality sized bass using the bay, including this guesstimated 17 incher, the largest of the three. It turned out these bass were using small tabletop sized three to four foot deep potholes for security. Holes that were left behind after the stumps that created them had rotted away. Clumps of filamentous algae provided some overhead cover as well. There were also a couple of scoured pathways leading from the holes onto the bluegill packed flats. I dropped the camera in on one of the pathways and caught the 17 incher moving onto the flat to hunt. For me, this was as good as catching her by rod and reel. Who actually gets to see this kind of stuff unfold before their eyes? I guess I'm going to have to stay a ways away, but to make the cast, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have one cast. Let's find that stump. Oh, there it is. I think I got it. Yep, I got it. big bass came out of here, it would push awake, so. Yep. That's a fish. That's a bass. I'll be darned. Get your head down, honey. Not that big, but for this pond so far, it's all right. I'll take it. All right, let's get you around where I can. Nope, I can't do you there. I'm going to have to catch you here. Ho, 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 ho. 
<laughs> I'm pleased to find a quality bass in great body condition and in such challenging casting conditions. Eggs. Let's see if you got. Oh, look at that. Look at that, man. Oh, yeah, nice female. I'll be darned. Smaller than the one I saw up here. Okay, I don't see anything in there. I don't want to take your food, but I want to see if I can just. It feels like another pickerel. Earlier in the year, I'd caught a very fat 16-incher that had swallowed an 8-inch grass pickerel. Interesting to see this again, especially with all the bluegills in the bay. Are you guys eating spawning pickerel? That's what that is. All right, she's about... 14 and a half inches. She might be 15. There you go, honey. <sighs> Moving further down that heat gradient put me in bigger, more voluminous water and to some prime cover. A little closer than I wanted to be, but I don't think I'm going to spook anybody. Or if you get a big one, it's going to be hard to get them out of there. That's a fish running for open water. Interesting to note, suggesting she's not a resident of that deadfall. She likely arrived from bigger water yet. Well, don't wrap me up, you. Oh, it's a big, big bass. Whoa! Okay, 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 okay. Take and drag on me. Don't jump. Stay pinned, honey. Whoa! Okay, that's... That's 20... 24? No. Let's see. How big are you, baby? This is 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 20, 24. You're going to be 22? No, not even. 24, 23, 22, 21, 20. No way. No way, you're bigger than that. Okay, turns out my rod was marked to 25 inches, not 24, my standard. So she was 22 and a half inches in length, putting her somewhere in the six pound bracket. Man. All right, there she is. That she coughed up. That's some, oh yeah, what a beautiful fish. What a beautiful fish. Look at her. Okay, hon, we're gonna put you back. Guess who's come to dinner? <laughs> Whew. 
Behaviorally, we're in the spring binge period. Locationally, we're at the lower end of the gradient, offering higher water volume and prime cover. First cast in there. Somebody. Oh, it's my big fish again. I'll be darned. I caught her again. Sorry, honey. I really didn't mean to. This one's got a belly. This is a different fish. This is a different fish. Don't jump. Oh, boy. All right, hon. Oh. Come on, hon. Yeah, this is a different fish. Oh. Yep. Oh, she's a beauty. She's an 18er. Oh. Yeah, I'll show you her in a minute. Let me get some sun going here and get a camera in position. There she is. She is beautiful. Look at this. Oh man. That is a beautiful fish. That's an 18er. And with that kind of a belly, she might be four pounds. Let's get that hook out. This is the way it went in. There it is. Oh yeah. No food sticking out. Teeth still on the red side. Beautiful fish. I'll save you the little boat chaos. She was 18 and 3 quarter inches and probably 4 pounds. The cheap plastic bump board I was using was not made for one-handed operation. Uh, I had to take it home and modify it for tiny boat use. <laughs> yeah, I deserved it. Holy moly. <laughs> All right, let's clean your lenses up. All right, I'm going to leave you with one more. Remember that guesstimated 17-incher I'd seen and then videoed? Well, I caught her. I'd come back a few evenings later to pull cameras and found her up on the flat chasing bluegills. I knew why she was up there, where she rested, and even what path she took to hunt. How cool is that? There we go, and that's a good one. There's a big fish up here. Unless it's a snapping turtle. <laughs> it's not. I caught her. Don't you do it. Don't you do it, honey. Oh, yes. That's the one I've been seeing. one I said was 1617. Yep, they're waiting for some dim lighting. Actually, they were active for much of the time, but darn tough to catch. All right, 
let's just see if she hits 17 and she should. <clears throat> Close your mouth, honey. 17 and a half. Yeah. Very nice, very nice fish. <sighs> yep, I'll take her. I'll take it. Very nice. There you go, hun. <laughs> 